All right. So um, we did a bit of a mid-session recap midway through the term that hopefully um, gave you a chance to sort of take stock and to consolidate some of the things that we have talked about up until that point sort of midway through. And now we're going to do the same thing, um, but throughout the entire term. So we started off in week one, really trying to hopefully contextualize for you why it is that we're spending a big chunk of this intro to psych unit talking about stats. So why is it that about a third of this unit is dedicated to not fundamentals of psychology, but instead to research methods and stats? And hopefully um, you've got the, the message by now that the reason that understanding research methods and stats is so important to psychology is because psychology follows a scientific framework for understanding human beings, understanding human behavior. So when we're studying psychology, we're interested in why people behave the way they do, how they think, how they act, how to help them, how to treat them, um, really just understanding everything there is to understand about human people. But the way that we do that, the way that we answer questions about human beings is that to use a scientific framework or the rigor of scientific method um, in order to get the answers to the questions that we have. And that's really using empirical methods, empirical science or empirical research to gather information about people, to observe what it is that they do under certain conditions and to draw conclusions based on that information, based on that data, to then get answers about, um, about human beings, to see if we can learn new things about human beings. And so the scientific method and understanding the scientific process is really so fundamental to psychology, which is why you need to learn about it right at the start of your understanding of psychology, your study of psychology, because understanding the scientific method and using the scientific method is how we get the answers to the questions that we have about people. So this is one version of the scientific method. We talked about this back in week one. This idea that when we're using the scientific method, when we're using empiricism, we start off with a theory and the theory for us comes from all of the research and all of the investigation that has been done to date, that has been done in this area so far. And we can get um, an understanding of what that theory is through observations ourselves, through reading the literature that has been um, like research that's already been done before by understanding research or thinking back on research that you yourself as a researcher might have done. And then based on our theory, once we have a framework for understanding a certain aspect of human behavior, we then will tend to develop a hypothesis or a prediction about what might happen in a new situation or a new context or under, trying to understand something new that we don't have the answer to yet. So we construct a hypothesis based on our theory, based on our understanding of human behavior to say what we think might happen in certain new circumstances or new conditions or just understanding a new question, but we don't yet know if that is going to be the case or not. And then once we have our hypotheses or our predictions, then what we need to do is design the study that can then test them. So the study design needs to be appropriate to the actual hypothesis, to the research question that you've got, and needs to be able to directly test the, the prediction, the expectation that you have. Once you've designed your study and you've collected your data, then you need to analyze the data. And that's where the stats comes in. So that's working out how to summarize the variables that you've got, working out what appropriate test it is to actually address your hypothesis, to test the hypothesis. Is it a t-test? Is it a correlation? What kind of analysis do you actually have to do? And then based on the actual results of that test, you then make a conclusion. So does it support your hypothesis? Does it not support your hypothesis? What does that mean? What are the implications of that? Or what's the takeaway message? And whatever those conclusions are, you then use that information as new information that you've learned to further divine that de to further develop the theory. Sorry, a noise just went outside my window and it startled me and I said the wrong thing. So based on the conclusions that you've got, um, you then need to use that information to further refine or develop your theory. That was what I was trying to say. 
So that's the scientific method process. And as you can see there, the actual stats part of it is a really small part of this entire process. It's more important um, that you think about the research process, the idea of getting new information in this kind of holistic perspective and understand how it is that the stats part of it actually plays or how, how it falls into um, the bigger context of this process. So hopefully that's made you understand, or well back then it did make you understand um, why we need kind of empirical science, empirical research in the context of psychology, in a discipline like psychology. Um, and that tells you why or how it is that statistical methods form a part of that scientific process. But more specifically, why is it that you need to learn what a mean is, what a t-test is, what a correlation is? Why do you actually have to learn the stats part of it? So hopefully you get it, that statistical methods are an essential part of psychological science and psychological research. And they're part of the, all the kinds of methods that we use are these quantitative statistical methods, which form part of quantitative research methods. And what we're interested in usually in psychology is people on a big scale. So if you have a question about adolescent development, if you have a question about, you know, the number of siblings that a person has and how that changes their social development, then what you might be interested in generally are adolescents. If you have a question about people who experience chronic pain, why it is that some people experience some kinds of chronic pain, why it is that chronic pain is more common in women than it is in men, what the best way of treating chronic pain is, then you're interested in chronic pain sufferers in general. If you're interested in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and you might be interested in why it is that some people experience treatment resistant PTSD, whereas others don't. Or you might be interested in how people develop complex skills like driving a car. So you might be interested in understanding novice drivers and how they go through that learning process to develop this very complicated skill. And that, in that instance, what you're interested in are people on that bigger scale. So all adolescents, all chronic pain sufferers, all individuals with PTSD or all novice drivers. So if that's what you're interested in, then there's two reasons that you need actual statistical methods that we've learned. And the first one of that is that people tend to vary. So if you're interested in adolescent development and the impact that having siblings has on their social development, one adolescent with three siblings, their experience might be quite different to another adolescent with three siblings. If you're interested in chronic pain sufferers, one person with chronic pain, their experience could be really different to another person with chronic pain. So people tend to vary. If we have questions about human behavior or human functioning, we can't just get the answers to those questions by asking one person or investigating one person or even two people or even five people. There's a lot of variability or differences between people, differences in their experiences, difference in the factors that might affect their experience, um, different characteristics of the people that then mean that there's variation or differences that go on there. And the second element here is that we can't measure everybody. So even if we're interested in all chronic pain sufferers, all individuals with PTSD, all novice drivers, we can't actually get access to everybody to ask them the questions, to get the data or the information from them. And those are the two reasons why we need stats, because stats gives us this process of aggregation, this process of summarizing information across people, summarizing or averaging or aggregating information. And it also gives us this process or gives us the methods to use the process of inference. An inference is the process that we go through in order to get information from a sample, a smaller group of people, and make a generalization back to a population. So those are the kind of the two most important elements of the statistical methods, which is why we need to use these methods, understand and to use them in a field like psychology. So in week two, we talked a bit more detail about some fundamental concepts. One of them was the distinction between the sample and the population. So even though our research question applies to the population, what we're interested in understanding is the population. What it is that we can get access to um, in our in the in terms of the actual information that we have, the actual data that we have, comes from a sample. And that's because, as discussed previously, we can't actually get access to our entire um, population. So we need to get information from the sample instead. 
So we get information from the sample, our data come from the sample, the stats that we do is analyzing that data from the sample, but we use that data from the sample to make a generalization back to a population. And so that the characteristics of that sample have to match as closely as possible um, the characteristics of the population. It has to be representative of the population. If there is bias, if they're different in any way, if they're systematically different, that can lead to biased results. So going into a little bit more detail about this idea of, of inference, these principles of inference, of inferential statistics, in an ideal world, what we would do is if we're interested in understanding adolescent development, we would then collect data from every single adolescent in the world or every single adolescent in Australia. So we would get information from our entire population and then we wouldn't need inference. We wouldn't need to make inferential um, inference. We wouldn't need to make inferences. We wouldn't need to make inferential conclusions. We would just then know what's happening at the population but we can't do that. So we can't do that because we can't get access to everybody. It's just not possible. It's not feasible. We don't have the money. We don't have the time. We don't have the resources to do that. We just can't do that. It's not possible. So the next best thing then would be to run the study multiple times in order to see what the average effect of the result is. So we could do that if we wanted to get an idea of what the general population level effect is, what the general population um, level conclusion would be. We could then run a study multiple times with multiple samples in order to see what the average effect of the result is. But again, we don't do that. Sometimes we do, but most of the time we don't do that um, because, again, it takes time, it takes resources to do that. So what the next best thing is, and this is the third best thing in terms of the options available to us here, is to use the process of inferential statistical methods to then um, add, to identify information from our sample and have a look at the pattern of information we have in our sample and therefore make a generalization or make a conclusion back to the population. And this uses this process, this, this concept of probability or likelihood in order to see how likely it is that there's an effect in our population based on information in our sample. So depending on how big the effect in our sample is, how much variability around that effect there is, how much difference there are between people, and also how many observations that effect is based on, we can get an idea of the likelihood that that effect does exist in the population from which our sample was drawn. So we can get a sense of how likely it is, what the probability is, that the reason we're seeing this effect in our sample is because there's a real effect in the population. So we use this process of inference. We're seeing what the chance is, what the probability is, what the likelihood is, that the effect that we're seeing in our sample is reflecting a real effect in the population. But this is an imperfect process. It's fundamentally drawing on probability. We can never be certain that we're seeing a real effect in the, pop in the, in the population based on the sample effect. All we can conclude is that it's likely that there is a population level effect. One of the other things we talked about back in week two, which is really important for pretty much every other week following it, was the different kinds of variables that we can have. So the different measurement levels, or the different types of variables in terms of how we can actually measure something. And we talked about four different types of variables. The first of which was a nominal variable. And this is the most basic or kind of the most simple kind of variable where we have a categorical variable with no order or hierarchy to the levels or the groups or the categories of that variable. So a nominal variable is an unordered categorical variable. You could have gender as your categorical variable. You could have discipline as your categorical variable. You could have state of Australia as your categorical variable. You could have um, anything that is groups, that is looking at groups or levels or categories of something, but there's no, there's no hierarchy or order to the grouping. The next level up is an ordinal categorical variable. So this is still categorical in that there's still groups or categories or types of things, but there is an order to them. So you could say that one category is higher or more than the other category. 
It's more of the thing that you're representing or less of the thing that you're representing, but you're still looking at categories or groups or types of things. Interval and ratio variables are both types of numeric variables. So they're both measuring something that's inherently numeric, something that's on a numeric scale. It's got a number property to it. So interval variables are on a numeric scale and there's consistent differences between points. So every interval between points is the same amount, the same distance or the same difference. But for interval variables, there's no meaningful zero point on an interval scale, which is contrasted with ratio variables where it is also numeric. There are also consistent differences between points, but also there's an absolute zero point. So for example, weight in kilograms. So both interval and ratio are numeric variables. Nominal and ordinal are categorical variables, also called quantitative for numeric and qualitative for categorical. In week three, we started our exploration of our stats program Stata. Um, we talked about uh, the idea of using a stats program both to summarize the data for us, so to make tables, to make graphs, but also to run statistical tests for us. And we used Stata throughout the rest of term to actually run the test that we were going to run. Um, and learning to use Stata and being able to interpret output from Stata is a really important element of this unit that hopefully you have developed. And then in week four, we started talking about summarizing data. Excuse me while I had a tea break there. So summarizing data in week four was talking about how to communicate efficiently or in a summarized or in a condensed way um, information that we've collected in the form of data. So rather than communicating every single score that we have, every single person on every single um, variable that we've got, we need to think about what the best, clearest way is to summarize that information. And summarizing data can come in two different sorts of forms, gra graphical or numeric summaries, but it also varies in terms of how many variables are involved in any individual summary. So we had univariate summaries, which is looking at a single variable at a time, univariate, one variable. And we also had bivariate summaries, which was looking at two variables at a time. And we had both of these kinds of summaries throughout our term. And as I mentioned, there's two different kinds of displays that we can do, two different kinds of summaries. Numeric summaries, which is where we use numbers to summarize, to aggregate or graphical summaries, which is where we use graphs or charts to summarize. And this is a demonstration of two different graphical summaries that didn't make them into, didn't make their way into the week four lecture, but it's a little addition now. The one up the top, uh, you'll be very used to looking at these kinds of things throughout the year. This exponential curve is what that's representing. Um, and the bottom one we learnt about in terms of scatter plots for our correlation lecture. Um, and there were lots of different types of summaries that we've learnt about throughout the term. And just like the process of picking what test to run, in terms of what um, actual summary it is that you should be producing to summarize any individual variable or set of variables, you need to think about what kind of variable it is. So is it a numeric variable or is it a categorical variable? Because there's different kinds of summaries for different sorts of variables.